Um, so hi everyone. Um, I need to share the screen. So hi everyone. Um, thanks very much, uh, Bill, for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity for being here. I'll be talking today about AI on the edge, but before I talk about AI on the edge, I would like to have a brief introduction to AI and what AI means. I think it's an important topic and I think it's uh, important that, uh, you know, in this particular topic, we use the right terminology. Um, so what is artificial intelligence? Um, this is a particular quote that I really like by Eric Hoffer, which is really kind of uh, sort of describing sort of um, uh, our human curiosity of understanding nature and building machines uh, based on our knowledge and understanding of nature, which I think in, in, in one way or another relates to our um, ambition in building automated uh, systems and automated machines, hence AI. Um, artificial intelligence, um, if you are uh, a fan of comic books or comic movies, uh, generally in the public eye is being discussed or uh, sort of portrayed in, in a very polarized fa fashion. So it's either good or bad. Um, so we're talking about automation as, for example, taking away jobs from people or or, or doing something that we are not really wanting to do. Or, and also even in pop culture, we have you know, very polarized vision of that. But this is not really the reality. Artificial intelligence is a very mixed picture. And one thing for certain is that as a society, we are more and more interested in artificial intelligence. We are even more interested in particularly in the last five years when it comes to artificial intelligence. The definition of artificial intelligence really is kind of the, the formal definition, is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, et cetera, et cetera. And when we talk generally in the public domain about AI, I think most people mean general AI, which is really a far sort of vision from where we are at the moment. In, in our day-to-day -day life, what we really mean and we use as AI and what we deal with on a daily basis is what we call narrow AI, which is really specific focusing technology that is being uh, developed and optimized to solve specific problems at great efficiency and you know with very comparable um, sort of performance to human beings. For example, like face recognition, uh, vehicle detection, all of that sort of things, very focused. Um, uh, technology, which can't really sort of generalize between one application and the other. Um, and I just, just kind of to indulge ourselves a little bit when we talk about intelligence, I think it just to kind of illustrate this is there is a deeper philosophical question about that. And I'd like to share this observation with you. Uh, so both Charles Darwin and Alan Turing realized that there is com competence without comprehension. Um, which basically the Turing uh, universal machine and natural selection are both mindless processes that can generate and build efficient complex systems. So, you know, intelligence not necessarily something, you know, comparable to human intelligence uh, in, in a way. And we need to think of intelligence or artificial intelligence as something uh, by its own. And I really particularly recommend reading this book by Con Consciousness Explained by uh, Daniel, Daniel Dunnett. It's a very interesting uh, uh, take on, on this uh, philosophical question. So talking about AI, I think it's important to kind of highlight a few key terminologies. AI uh, as, a, as, a, as a topic is a very wide, uh, if you like, uh, area that encapsulates so many different things in it. Sometimes it's been interchangeably used with machine learning and other technologies, but it's machine learning is a subset of that. So when we talk about machine learning, machine learning as a term has been coined by Arthur Samuel in 1959. But what basically means is being able to build a computer system that can learn problems, uh, problem solving without being explicitly programmed to do so. And it's an amalgamation of different topics, mathematical modeling, statistical analysis, probability theory, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in deep learning, there's a slightly sort of different approach or way of doing this. And I, I, the reason I'm mentioning this is because that relates to the AI on the edge and how we are now evolving to use these type of algorithms on the edge. 
So deep learning is well suited to, inter to interface directly with the raw data. It's a very powerful mechanism, a data-driven one, to be able to optimize the, um, the machine learning process by extracting features that are specifically tuned to the solving that particular problem. That comes with a lot of benefits, but also has quite a lot of risks and, and, and uh, um, demands, particularly around data um, gathering and, and um, being able to interrogate the outcome model. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the motivation behind AI on the edge. Um, I think, you know, the cloud, particularly in cloud services, is, is being a very useful uh, innovation for all sorts of different industries and businesses. And, you know, the likes of Microsoft and Amazon have been doing great job in this area. But there is a need for being able to distribute the computational power of these back-end systems closer to the edge, to the sensor system, for, se for several reasons. One of them is low latency and real-time decision-making. So, for example, you know, when you're actually working with AI at the edge, allows you to be able to do mission-critical, time-sensitive decision-making without being dependent on network traffic and bandwidth, signal coverage, delay in transmission of data between the backend and, and your remote device. You know, this is particularly important in situations, for example, like we were talking about autonomous vehicle. You know, th there's no circumstances in which you want to have a delay in making a decision, for example, in an emergency break uh, by even milliseconds. And being able to do that particular decision on the spot is very, very important without any delays. The other is data security and privacy. Um, I think we are a lot more aware these days about data security and privacy. And I think, you know, there's quite a lot of rules and regulation around that. And it's a very challenging problem, um, you know, being able to sort of, you know, still do the analytics and provide the new sort of technologies that can help the quality of human life, but also maintaining um, data security and privacy of individuals as well. So AI at the edge can help really in solving a lot of these problems, mainly by anonymizing data at the source. So for example, the sensor system itself can provide some level of obstructing data in order to uh, remove sensitive information. Also, it reduces the need to store raw data. So you know, once the data or the information has been extracted from the data, there's no need really to store that data if it's not going to be processed again. What you need is the information that has already been extracted, which necessar that doesn't necessarily have to be or contain some personal information. The other thing is being able to reduce the exposure of that data through transmission and storage, you know, because we didn't really need to transmit the data through networks and from different platforms in order to be able to do the processing, the processing can really happen very close to the sensor at the source, which means that potential hacks, um, you know, exploitation of that data is, is, is also reduced. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes when we're using some cloud services, um, you know, we, in a way, if we hand over the management of privacy to these services by, by if, we, if we hand over the, the, the data, I mean, a lot of the services provided really take care of that, but nevertheless, we're giving away data that could potentially be misused somehow. So if you consider a, a smart city scenario particularly, you know, and looking at the camera sensor, you know, cameras are actually a very nice example of demonstrating this because the volume of data generated by cameras is very large, very, uh, particularly with the latest technology and the high definition camera sensor we have. So if you consider an urban scene like the one we see on the right, um, you can see there's so many things going in there, you know, but we didn't really need to transmit that information, that, that image particularly to the cloud to be able to uh, extract the relevant information from it. We could do that on the spot really and only transmit the information that has been generated by the uh, AI algorithm. This, this particular output is from a, an algorithm called DenseCab, which is a, one of the, kind of very uh, elegant algorithm in solving that problem. 
On the other hand, you can also anonymize that data if you really still want to transmit the videos by, so for example, masking people's faces and number plates and things like that, which can also help you sort of, you know, reduce the need to, uh, um, you know, or reduce the need or to reduce the, the chances of containing any private, private data in that uh, raw data. So some, for example, like pixelated faces or pixelated number plates. <clears throat> um, and the other one is energy and cost. I, I just actually extracted this uh, particular article from Wired uh, just to kind of highlight a few things. And I found it fascinating really um, that our sort of human demand to sort of run more AI algorithm has increased by about 300 folds between 2012 and 2018. And if you actually look at what has been sort of estimated in this, out, in, in this particular um, article, you know, there's a, a, a particular algorithm has been released at the beginning of this year to solve the Rubik cube using robotic hand. And it's been estimated that this might actually consume about 2.8 gigawatts of hours of electricity. That is roughly equal to the output of three nuclear power plants for an hour. I mean, let this sink in for a second. That's, that's massive. You know, if you consider all the computational power needed to run all of these data centers and all of these sort of servers, it's, it's huge. It has a massive impact on the environment. It has a massive impact on all sorts of different things in our life. And if you add to that as well, the cost of transmitting and installing sort of new sort of uh, uh, transmission infrastructure, all of that stuff, you know, and that is there's a cost to the business, but also a cost to to the environment as well. That potentially AI on the edge can help uh, to reduce uh, and drive down the computational demand uh, for this, as well as reduce the need to transmit that large volumes of data. So I hear you ask, why now? Why AI on the edge now? Uh, and why it's, it's actually has been, um, you know, we've been talking about this more and more, and it's becoming a lot more popular in the last uh, few years, particularly. There are two main reasons, uh, mainly the availability of software, but also the availability of really um, hardware, really highly computational, so capable hardware that can be deployed on the edge. Almost all the big players, all the big sub hardware suppliers, uh, as well as some software suppliers now provide some, some tools and some sort of embedded devices that can allow you to do some level of inferences and, and machine learning um, sort of uh, uh, tasks on, on the edge. You know, for example, here is the call chip, which has been developed by Google, where there's the Movidia chip as well from Intel. Qualcomm famously had quite a lot of different platforms like the RB3 and the RB, RB2. And a lot of these things are actually now live in, in quite a lot of uh, uh, mobile phone devices. ARMS, now they have their own sort of uh, AI platform. Um, and obviously, famously, NVIDIA has been capitalizing on this uh, enormously. And they have a wide range of different embedded devices that allow you to do this computation on the edge. But the other side of this is the availability of software. You know, quite a lot of different platforms and libraries that allow you to do machine learning now are available, are freely available for people to use. And they're quite easy. And a lot of this development now is changing dramatically. So there's quite a lot of different, uh, you know, tools that you can use in order to be able to deploy and, and develop these technologies quite easily, really. <clears throat> um, and this meant that we have almost an explosion of different applications where AI on the edge can actually happen. So, you know, Bill mentioned, for example, that we used to work um, extensively on smart city application from end to end doing AI on the edge all the way to the cloud. And, and smart cities is one of the main areas in which that can, can happen. And also Industry 4.0 is, is a very nice example of that, where a lot of IoT devices now require to have some, some level of intelligence that allow you to do some basic tasks and, and sort of, you know, and, and some level of automation 
obviously urban mobility uh, transportation is another big topic you know connected vehicles autonomous vehicles and other sort of you know tra public transport is is becoming very um, um, uh, you know keen and, and a big user of that technology as well as for example you know uh, telemedicine, it's remote monitoring um, and all of that stuff to help, for example, in this current situation with the COVID-19, you know, it helps having uh, these sort of wearable devices that we can utilize in order to be able to monitor patient remotely without having to sort of expose more people to the disease and things like that. In addition to security and surveillance demand, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, application at the moment in this area. Okay, so what is the future when it comes to AI on the edge? I think, in my opinion, um, as, a, as a machine learning community particularly, we really need to break this traditional cycle of gathering data, annotating data, training and deploying. Because I think, you know, once, you know, for example, you train a machine learning model on the, on the, say, on the cloud and deployed it, this is the time where the machine learning algorithms stop learning and now it start decaying because the, the environment will change, the target will change. However, the machine learning algorithm itself stays the same. And being able to get away from the reductionist, this reduction approach by enabling and innovating around having uh, AI models that can evolve you know, on the edge is, is a very important uh, development to help us sort of uh, expand that topic. And another challenge there is low size, weight, and power. Obviously, these devices are not really comparable in terms of their cap computational capacity when it comes to the uh, server ends. But that means that we have to optimize these uh, algorithms to make them run on the edge more uh, smoothly and, and, and more efficiently. Another is basically is system reliability. It's a big topic because mainly machine learning based AI systems are complex systems are undeterministic. So being able to handle system failures and being able to provide you know, reliable services is really crucial. And last is basically being able to update models and platforms over the edge, uh, over the air. And this is very important. Um, you know, there are now solutions where people are exploring, for example, federated learnings to solve all sorts of different problems where we can do some level of trading remotely as well as uh, centralized. So in summary, really, um, I think AI is here to stay. It has a very rapid growth and the AI on the edge story is an integ integral part of that, of that growth. AI on the edge complements AI in the cloud and it provides a balance between the powerful cloud computing and the localized low latency decision-making. So in my opinion, I think the future will have to be a combination of both AI on the edge and on, in the cloud as well. Thank you very much.